Hey everybody, it's Miss Audrey from the Fairfield County District Library at our downtown Lancaster location and today I'm talking about books! Yay! Today I'm talking about nonfiction, which I happen to love and I know a lot of reluctant readers or struggling readers, they tend to really like nonfiction too. Um, it's a little bit more directly applicable to real life, so it tends to appeal to a lot of kids. And the books I have here today, sh there should be something in this stack for basically everybody. I'm going to start with one that I didn't realize the library had even gotten until this morning and I have been waiting for it to get here. It is called Escape at 10,000 Feet. It's by Tom Sullivan. It's the first book of a new series called The Unsolved Case Files. And it is about um, the... Um, D.B. Cooper and the Missing Money is the subtitle, and it is about the Norjack, Northwest hijacking case, wherein a man calling himself Dan Cooper purchased a plane ticket in 1971 on the day before Thanksgiving, going from Portland, Oregon to Seattle, Washington for $20. Apparently you could buy a plane ticket for $20 in 1971. That all by itself blew my mind. Um, and as soon as he got on the plane, he slipped the stewardess a note saying that he had a bomb. He demanded twenty or two hundred thousand um, dollars, some parachutes, and a couple of other things. And um, nobody wanted the bomb to go off, so the FBI complied. And um, at the next stop, and then the airplane took off again with him on board, and he parachuted off of the plane, and then. No one's ever seen him since. And so this book breaks down the case. The graphics are great. The writing's really good. Um, there's some cool photographs in the back from the actual FBI case file. I loved it. This was great. Um, so true, true crime for kids. Um, nothing scary or, or gory or anything about it. I'd say good for about third grade plus right here. Um, I loved it. The next one to come out is going to be about um, Alcatraz, the jailbreak at Alcatraz, and I am waiting on Tenter Hooks. I can't wait. Um, the other book, very timely, very timely subject here. It's called A Shot in the Arm by Don Brown. It's part of the Big Ideas That Changed the World series. It is also a graphic novel series. Um, it's, this one in particular is A History of Vaccines, and it includes COVID-19 research. The book itself ends in uh, 2020, so you could argue that the very end of it's already a little bit outdated, but um, it starts ta by talking about smallpox and how it was basically a wor worldwide scourge for years, um, and um, how it was combated in uh, ancient China and ancient India, and um, how people learned how to sort of inoculate people against smallpox even before they even learned what uh, bacteria and viruses even were, which is pretty cool. So it starts by talking about um, smallpox and then worked up to um, polio and all, all the way up to polio um, and all the way up to the beginning of COVID. And it's really interesting. It could be a really heavy book and it isn't. It's um, the science and the history are both broken down in a very relatable way uh, for, that's perfect for kids and even adults who don't know much about the history or the science of the subject, of the topic. Um, I do have to say that the word crippled is used a couple of times in a way that's a little bit jarring. It might be unpleasant for some readers, um, so a little content warning there. But other than that, it's really good, and it talks about how people have been protesting vaccines pretty much since the get-go, um, even though they have saved literally millions of lives. So, A Shot in the Arm by Don Brown. That was a really good read. The next one is another graphic novel. I promise you they're not all graphic novels, just a few really good graphic novels have come out so far. This is another new, part of another new graphic novel series called History Comics, and it's this one is The Wild Mustang, Horses of the American West by Chris Duffy and Phelan Cope. 
as you may know, there's no such thing as too many horse books in the library. There are some readers who want every horse book they can possibly get their hands on and we never have enough of them. So I was thrilled when this one came out. It's the history of horses in the American West from prehistory uh, to now, because horses actually, they're, they're, their ancient, ancient ancestors actually evolved in the American West, and they crossed land straits during ice ages to into Asia, and um, went extinct on the American continent until European colonists brought them back. What I like about this book is it discusses uh, how the Europeans brought horses back to the American continent. It discusses the ways in which horses were really important to Native American cultures once they were able to get their hands on them. And it's very upfront about um, Europeans' dealings with Native Americans as well. So it's, it's solid history from start to finish across the board. It, talks, it ends by talking about current management of wild Mustangs, which is a little bit sad. Um, populations are much better than they were about 50 years ago when people were just trying to eradicate the Mustangs, but it's still not perfect. It's not ideal because overgrazing is still a problem and horses are still sort of, the wild horses are still competing with cattle and, and so forth. Um, but it's still a really great book. Horse lover, lovers will love it. It ends at the very end, at the very end of the book. There are some biographies of famous Mustangs and also famous um, famous people who worked with Mustangs. I'm having trouble turning to the page. There we go. So for the horse lovers in your life, that's a really good choice. The next one is a biography, and it's not a graphic novel. It is called A Sporting, uh, a Sporting Chance, How Ludwig Gutmann Created the Paralympic Games. Perfect for this summer when hopefully Tokyo will in fact be hosting the games. I heard the other day they were discussing the possibility of postponing them again. I'm hoping that's not necessary. I could really use some Olympics in my life. Um, so I would say that this book is appropriate for ages eight plus or so. Um, it's really well laid out. There's a, a great mix of, of drawn illustrations and photographs. But as to what the book is about, Ludwig Gutmann was a German-Jewish neurosurgeon who fled the Holocaust with his wife and kids to the UK at the beginning of World War II. The book does a really good job of breaking down the basics of what the Holocaust was for kids who, for whom that might be a new topic. Um, and Gutmann worked with people who were paralyzed. Um, and before his work, uh, it was considered a condition not treated. So when people got into accidents or were hurt in war and their spines were damaged, nobody knew what to do about it and the conditions were left untreated and most of those individuals wound up dying in really kind of unpleasant ways. And Gutman was determined to change that and he did. Uh, he figured out how to save people's lives and not just save their lives but actually how to help them have a high quality of life. And one of the things he did was he realized that sports and exercise were a great way to bring back people's self-esteem and their physical prowess and so they could feel healthy and secure in their own bodies and also help them socialize with the rest of the human race again. And um, he started holding competitive sporting events at his hospital in the UK. And they eventually, within a decade or so, started getting invited to have those games at the Olympic Games and they evolved into the Paralympic Games. So this guy is pretty awesome. I'd never heard of him before. It's a short read, it's a quick read, and it's a very interesting one. Ludwig Gutmann is one of my new heroes, actually. This is such a good book. Um, that is such a good book. And I think it'd be a great classroom read aloud too. The next one also takes place during World War II. It's a little less uplifting. It's called Ensnared in the Wolf's Lair, inside the 1944 plot to kill Hitler and the ghost children of his revenge. It's um, published by National Geographic, so you know it's good. And the author is Anne Bous Bousum. 
Um, I'd say that this is good for ages about 10 plus. So in 1944, there was a plot to kill Hitler and sadly it did not work. And Hitler was, as you could imagine, very upset about this. And he decided to carry out his revenge, not just against the people who tried to kill him, but against their entire families. So he arrested all of the adult members of those families, all of their older teenage children, and then he essentially had their younger children kidnapped. They were taken to a out of the way youth retreat deep in the woods and um, the kids were split up by age. They were renamed. The siblings all did maintain the same last names happily. Um, the, the, there's a theory that they were renamed so that they could eventually be adopted out to more um, loyal families inside the Third Reich. Uh, but the end of the war happened before uh, that part of the plot could be carried out. Um, Germany started losing the war. Uh, and a lot of the children wound up getting returned before that could happen, thank goodness for them. Though there were a handful of children who were kept at this youth retreat all the way up until they were essentially liberated by the Allied forces. Um, it's a fascinating story. A lot of the information comes from a journal that one of the girls kept while she was in captivity. She either kept it while she was in captivity or she wrote it right afterward because her parents had a lot of questions and she was trying to answer them. And I read this a few months ago, so I'm forgetting if she kept it then or if she wrote it all down right afterward to better explain it to her parents. Um, it's a bestseller though in Germany. Um, and it was used as a primary source document to write this book. It is a little difficult to keep track of all of the adult conspirators' names in the book, but the back matter is fantastic. Uh, it, this it breaks down all of the different uh, families that were involved, all of the different kids' names, how old they were, stuff like that. Um, there's notes and timelines and all sorts of great stuff in the back matter. And it's a fascinating story. Even if you can't keep all the names straight, the story will have you on the edge of your seat. So really good book right there. So those were all history based. We're moving out of that. This is probably the best book of its kind I have ever seen in my life. I actually bought it for all of my nephews between the ages of five and nine. If I had any nieces, I would have bought it for them too. It's called Consent for Kids, Boundaries, Respect, and Being in Charge of You. The little person saying, I'm the ruler of my own body. And it's by Rachel Bryan. Um, so yeah, I would recommend it for young kids right on up. And it's age appropriate discussion of what consent means. Um, kids can read it by themselves if they're able to or with an adult. I do advise adults sort of skim through the book themselves just so they know what's in it and have discussions with their kids on the subject because it's so important. Um, but there are really kid friendly examples of what consent is and there's nothing scary in it. There's nothing graphic and it's really funny. For example, um, on this page, clothing isn't consent. People have their own reasons for dressing the way they do. They feel cold, doesn't want to be recognized, is hiding their dog in there. So stuff like that. This is a little mini comic about people not wanting to be tickled. I hate being tickled with a burning passion. I love that that's in there. Um, or over here, it talks about um, sometimes you say something's okay and then you change your mind and it says sometimes people get upset if you change your mind. They might get frustrated, annoyed, or even angry, but you still get to decide. So it really breaks a lot of things down. It's, it's really thorough, but it's really funny. It's really great. And it's a wonderful way to start having some super important discussions with your kids about their own rights, but also um, how they should be treating other people as well. So I love this book. I think it's amazing. And I frankly think every household should have it. So everyone knows someone in their life who's a little on the self-conscious side, and this might be a great book for them. It's called So Embarrassing, Awkward Moments and How to Get Through Them. It's by Sharice Miracle Harper, who's a best-selling fiction author, but she was a really great choice for this as well. 
Um, it breaks down what embarrassment is, like on a sort of scientific, scientific level. It discusses why it happens, how it's super common, everybody feels it, and also ideas to deal with common situations. Like, oh, you thought someone was waving at you. No, they're waving at the person behind you, and now you feel super embarrassed. Or like, if your parents are embarrassing you in public, how do you deal with that? Or, oh no, you've just dropped water in your lap and it looks like you've peed yourself. How do you cope with this stuff? This book, again, it is a graphic novel and it, it breaks it down. It makes you feel like you're a little less bad yourself, but it also gives you some coping mechanisms and um, it's very empathetic. It's also very funny. Um, so if you know anyone in your life who could maybe use something like that, it's a good resource. On a similar vein, but slightly different, we have All About Anxiety by Carrie Lewis, illustrated by Sophia Tuliatu. Um, and again, if, if a kid's reading this by themselves, I'd say it's good for about ages 10 plus, but with adult help, maybe eight plus, um, eight years plus. And it's all about anxiety. It talks about it from a scientific level, but also different kinds of anxiety, like social anxiety or phobias. Um, even It even mentions OCD and things like that. It talks about what might be triggers for you and coping strategies when you should get help, that kind of a thing. It provides specific suggestions for dealing with school um, or starting the discussion about maybe having anxiety with your family members and more. And it ends with a really good resource list at the very end, which is nice. Um, some of the pages in particular that I thought were really well done were, there's a whole section of things that make me anxious. And then it talks about common things that are sources of anxiety for kids, like changing families, either through separation and divorce or a death in the family or there being a new baby. It breaks things down there. Um, another one that was really good were in the things that make me anxious section were people who don't help me feel my best. And it talks about possessive friends and negative friends. It talks about social media and comparing yourself to others and the pressure to perform and all sorts of really common stressors in kids' life and also helpful tips on how to cope with things like that, but also when to reach out for help. It's very reach out for help positive, which I think is a great message. So this was, this is a really great book. I also like this book because I feel like adults reading it will get really useful tips and tools on how to talk to kids themselves. So it's great for kids to read themselves, but for adults and caregivers who maybe have kids in their lives who have anxiety, it might be helpful for them to read to get ideas for how to have those conversations too. All right. 13 Things Strong Kids Do, the Think Big, Feel Good, Act Brave by Amy Morin. She's a best-selling author. This is her first book for kids. She's done um, books for adults. Again, I'd say this is good for about ages 10 plus. Each chapter focuses on a different kid in a hypothetical situation, such as they're jealous of the, the nice stuff their friends have, or um, they're lying about their homework and now they've bombed a test, or um, they got an audition that didn't go the way they wanted to or they tried out for a sports team and they didn't get on it and stuff like that. And it talks about how they're initially set back by what happened but then they turn it into an opportunity for growth. And every chapter offer, offers tools and tips for changing mindsets and building healthy mental habits. The book itself is really readable. The format is super easy and manageable. Um, it's not overwhelming. The art's pretty good. Art can really make or break a book like this and I, I feel like they did a good job with the art. Um, the layout's great and yeah it's good. It's really good. Um, it does sort of assume that kids are um, upper working class or higher. It does sort of make assumptions that way. Um, there are some kids in here who are 
not quite as financially well off as, as, as others, but um, for the most part, very solid choice. All right, but my last two books here are more for seventh or eighth grade plus, but they were really good and I wanted to touch on them briefly. This is one that I actually borrowed from Columbus Metropolitan Library, but you can get it through our consortium. And it's called True or False, a CIA, CIA Analyst's Guide to Spotting Fake News by Cindy L. Otis. And it's really good. It starts by talking about fake news since the time of the pharaohs, how people have been trying to sell their side of the story via propaganda and stuff since the dawn of time. Um, and it talks about different kinds of fake news, like propaganda, yellow journalism, conspiracy theories, and so on and so forth. And it gives tips on how to spot and analyze and debunk the different kinds of fake news. Every chapter's got some quiz type activities to check knowledge and understanding. And it uses like social media posts and things like that. So, so like real life, looking examples to fact check from. So it's it's really good. It's accessible, it's interesting, it's not exactly a, a light read, but it's a really good one. And I think that kids would get a lot out of it. I think that it would be a useful part of a curriculum. I also think that there are some kids who might wanna read it just to read it because it's relevant it's a good book. And last but not least is another graphic novel. Uh, it's called Amazon's Abolitionists and Activists, A Graphic History of Women's Fight for Their Rights. It's by Mickey Kendall and A. Damifo. And uh, it's a whirlwind tour of women's rights from antiquity, like ancient Mesopotamia, until now, uh, since it, it is a world survey. Uh, especially the really old stuff is kind of glossed over really quickly. So the older it is, the more it's simplified. Like it kind of implies that uh, the patriarchy comes from ancient Rome, which that's what I studied in college and that is super oversimplified. But you know, it's still good. Uh, for an introduction, it's good. Um, it is a little bit Western centric, but they make a real point of being very, um, inclusive of all civil rights movements and it it focuses not just on white people but the contributions of people of all races all abilities and so on and so forth um and it traces major movements and it names big names um and it's a really solid introduction to the history of women's rights and the closer you get to the modern day the more detailed the information gets so um Again, especially for seventh grade plus, I really would recommend this book too. And it's fun. It's really good. And it takes the frame story is that there's a handful of girls in a futuristic setting who are like getting visit using a hologram sort of a situation to go back in time to visit different historical settings and see people. So that's kind of cool with a sort of computer tutor type person teaching them. So this is good. I liked it too. So hopefully there's something in there for everybody and hopefully you'll find something you enjoy. This is our last virtual program for a little while. We're taking a break through the month of May. We'll start our programming up again in June. Our summer reading program starts on June 1st. It is for all ages. We have separate programs for kids, teens, and adults. You'll be able to track your reading challenge either by app or by a paper log, whatever works best for you. Um, more information will be on our website shortly, so keep your eyes tuned for that. We will also start story times and things like that again the week of June 7th. So again, keep your eyes peeled on our Facebook page and on our website for more. And if you choose to visit us in person, please remember you have to wear a mask that covers your nose, your mouth, and your chin at all times inside the building. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.